This is the final event in our fall series, and I've come to think of it as our grand finale. It's Giving Tuesday, and what better gift for us to bring you on stage two great American novelists, Russell Banks and William Kennedy. I think of them as literary heavyweights, and I feel a little like the ring announcer before a big heavyweight fight, like, you know, Ali Frazier. I'd start out in this corner, in the far corner, weighing in at 175, wearing the tan blazer, <laughs> North End's Albany Cyclone, Bill Kennedy. The other corner, Saratoga slugger, Russell Banks. And if I had to score it, I think Bill has a longer reach, but Russell, I know he's a street fighter and he's got a mean uppercut. Um, but don't expect any drama or fisticuffs or a fight to break out tonight. These are two great friends who have been there for each other over the long haul, through thick and thin. They're the kind of friends we all cherish. Each one is there to celebrate a new book, a fresh new award, and also to talk through the dark nights of the soul and to commiserate with each other whenever wrestling with a blank page turns into a grind. Bill and Russell are those kinds of great friends, the sort every writer hopes to find, a great literary kinship. I'm not gonna run through a bio for each of them because we'd be here in the wee hours. I'll try to do something a little unorthodox, a dual introduction. Combined, these two men of letters have published 22 novels. Beginning in 1969, six nonfiction books, six story collections, two children's books, two books of poetry, several screenplays, a few plays, and two operas. But there's more. Two selections to the American Academy of Arts and Letters, the Pulitzer Prize, two finalists for the Pulitzer Prize, translations into more than two dozen languages. There are also two very generous and supportive mentors to countless young writers and to the literary community on the local, state, national, and international levels. They're two writers who never forgot where they came from, and they've paid it forward. A word on tonight's format, Russell will start off by reading a section from his latest novel, Forgone. I would mention that there are copies for sale. Our great independent bookseller, Bookhouse, is here tonight with copies for sale, and we'll have a book signing afterwards. Um, then Bill, after Russell finishes reading, is ready to jump in with his questions to kick off the conversation. We'll leave, leave time for audience q and I'll come around with a microphone. And um, Bill will also make his way to the signing table because wherever we go, people want Bill to sign copies of his books. So like I said, we're not gonna have any knockouts, any standing eight counts tonight. Just two brilliant writers and old friends talking about their craft. Please, a rousing Albany welcome for two literary lions, Russell Banks and William Kennedy. Well, th thank you, Paul. That, that's such a generous um, introduction. And uh, let me say what a pleasure and honor it is to be here. I haven't been over to the Institute for a couple of years. It's nice to be back and, and especially uh, under these auspices with uh, my dear friend, Bill Kennedy, uh, who we were reminiscing about earlier. Um, we've known each other and been close since 1986, it was, right? Yeah, but we couldn't, re we, that was so far back in time, our, both our memories faded and we couldn't recall where it was or how we met, but we knew by 86, we were in regular touch from then on. Um, I'm going to just read a, a, a relatively short passage from, um, from the novel Foregone. It's difficult to read from a novel, um, especially if the pieces are both as disparate um, and I hope integrated as, as uh, the pieces of this novel are. Um, and um, there's a lot going on, cutting back and forth in time and, and, and point of view. Um, but I will just give you a little information to begin with so you can follow it. And this will give you some sense of the tone and the context of the novel, I hope, in, in 10 minutes or so. Um, 
the main character, Leo Fife, Leonard Fife, who is a um, Canadian American uh, documentary filmmaker of the left, celebrated um, over his lifetime, one of the um, uh, 60,000 Americans who uh, went north to Canada to avoid being inducted into uh, the mili US military and sent to Vietnam, um, is dying of cancer and he is being filmed uh, making uh, his last interview by a man, Malcolm, who is uh, the director of the film uh, with his um, assistant and producer, Diana, and with the cameraman, Vincent, and, um, um, and, a, and a sound person, um, a young woman with them. Uh, also, uh, Leonard Fife's wife, Emma, and importantly, um, Renee, a Haitian nurse who has been caring for Leonard Fife. Fife has been telling the stories of his past and the truth of his past, um, his final confession, his last confession, and to, telling it to the camera, to Malcolm's camera. Cutting into Fife's scrambled and scrambling account of what sounds like one of his many adulteries, Malcolm announces it's time to take a break. He and Diana need to consult privately. Who the hell was Amanda? Where the fuck is this going? Is he just making it up? Among the others, except for Fife, there is an air of relief and audible exhalation. They haven't been able to follow where Fife has tried to take them and are confused by the meandering route he has taken and exhausted from trying to keep up with him. They don't understand his evasion of Malcolm's and Diana's prepared questions, his stubborn refusal to be properly interviewed. They don't know what to believe. Does it matter? Everyone remains silent. After a few moments, Emma says in a choked voice, it's the medications. Sometimes he, he confabulates like he's dreaming. We shouldn't be doing this, she suddenly tells Malcolm. She asks him to destroy what they've shot so far. It's not even half true. Most of what he's saying is misremembered and half invented or completely made up. It's wrong to be filming it, Malcolm, even if you end up not using it. The lights come on and Fife looks around at the six others, Renee and Emma seated on the sofa behind him, Sloan and Vincent standing by the camera, Diana clutching her clipboard in the corner of the room. Malcolm standing next to Fife in his wheelchair in the center of the room in front of the camera. Malcolm lays his hand on Fife's skeletal shoulder and softly pats it. Renee tells Fife that it's past time for her to empty his bag and give him his prednisone. Diana says to no one in particular, though it's clearly directed to Emma, that Leo seems to want to continue, so why not let him? It'll all come together and make sense when it's edited. She likes the stuff about his early ambitions to be a poet and writer. It's relevant to his shift to film. And people will want to hear about his American years in the 1960s, she points out. Okay, some of it's a little too personal and private maybe and not very clear, but that can be edited out so no one's heard or confused. A lot of this can be cut. The two and a quarter hours they've shot so far might come down to barely 15 minutes of screen time, for instance. Sloan asks, did you really not know about this, Emma? I mean, the wife in Virginia and the son and the other wife, the first one, and the baby girl? Jesus, Sloan, leave it alone, Malcolm says. He tries explaining to her and probably to himself and the others as well that all kinds of things have been mixed together in Fife's mind. He quotes Emma, it's the meds, confabulation, memories, hallucinations, fiction and films, other people's stories, fantasies. It's like trying to tie a novel to the author's real life, he says, you can't do it. We shouldn't worry. Emma knows the story of Fife's life better than anyone. She's been living and working with him for 40 years. I'm sorry, Sloan says, I didn't mean to. Emma says, I know everything about him that I need to know. Jesus, you're talking about me as if I'm not in the fucking room, Fife says. Like I can't hear you. I do hear you. Emma says, you're right, darling, I'm sorry. 
Malcolm says he's sorry too. Come on, folks, this is Leo's show, not ours, he reminds him. Renee releases the brakes on Fife's wheelchair and declares that she must take Monsieur Fife back to his room for a few moments. If they wish to continue today with the filming and Monsieur Fife feels strong enough to comply and wishes to do it, she will bring him back to the living room. She looks at Emma as she says this, as if it is Emma's decision whether to continue the filming. Then straightway she wheels him from the room. As they cross the dark hallway and pass into the dining room, Fife, speaking English, says to Rene, I'm not confabulating, you know. I'm really not. And it's not the meds. And Emma's wrong, he says. She doesn't know everything about me that she needs to know. He did live in Virginia where he was married and he had a son. And before that, there was an 18 year old girl he met in Florida and he got her pregnant and married her when he was 19 and went with her to Boston where they had a daughter. He insists it's all true. He remembers it like it happened yesterday. Do you believe me? He asks Renee. She answers, je crois que vous croyez c'est vrai. I believe that you believe it's true. She wheels him through the kitchen and onto the bedroom and bathroom that he has not shared with his wife for nearly two months. He wonders how much he was able to say to the camera this morning of what he actually remembers. He knows there is a synaptic snafu between the data received from the memory banks of his hippocampus and his prefrontal cortex that scrambles the words he's led to speak when he tries to convert that data to speech. It is another reason for wanting Emma there. She's the only one who can bridge the gap between his memories and his descriptions of them, as if he is speaking in a language that only she and he understand. He and Emma are his brain's only native speakers. This is love, is it not? It's the same as when he first wakens but is not yet completely awake or when he begins to fall asleep and has not yet fully entered sleep. He speaks aloud, half inside a dream and half outside it. Emma lying next to him or reading silently in a nearby chair says, what? What are you talking about, Leo? And he says, it's nothing. Nothing. I was dreaming. But he wasn't dreaming. He was caught for a few seconds between being asleep and being awake. And the two worlds briefly overlapped. And there was a break, a gap between what he was seeing and hearing and what he could say of it. And he was unable to speak from that gap and had to cry out like a mountain climber fallen into a glacial crevasse suspended from his rope calling for help to a search party miles away. His rescuers hear bits and pieces of his cries carried on the wind, but are unable to make out the words or determine where they're coming from. His speech is not garbled or blocked in any way, the way it would be if he suffered a stroke or an injury to his brain. He's not aphasic. He's almost two separate people. And one of them remembers in great detail a distant past, and the other who does not remember anything of that past tries to describe it. The conflict causes a loud sparking static that makes it nearly impossible for him to hear what he is saying, just as he cannot see what the camera is seeing. He no more knows what he sounds like through Sloan's mic than he knows what he looks like to Vincent's camera and to the six other people in the room. He is sure that he has said nothing that is not true. He has not lied, but he does not know what he has said. Maybe that's how it goes when you have not lied. You don't know what you have said. Only liars know what they have said. Rene unclips the bag of urine from the catheter tube and empties the bag into the toilet. She wraps her arms, her arms around Fife from behind and eases him from the wheelchair to the toilet. He's not paralyzed, but his limbs and trunk are too feeble to carry the weight of his body. He has lost nearly half his 200 pounds of muscle and bone and is as light as he was at 14. She slips his sweatpants down his scrawny thighs and goes to the door and tells him to call her when he's ready to be wiped and leaves him alone, sitting on the toilet with his pants puddled at his ankles. 
There is nothing left of his life now except what's in his brain and the fluids that pass through his bowels and bladder and the cancer cells that are devouring his bones and flesh, munching on his organs, shutting them down one by one. He has not been able to digest solids for weeks. He hasn't had sex with Emma or anyone else for three years, nor has he managed to ejaculate for nearly a year. No one who isn't being paid for it wants to touch his body, not even Emma, not even he himself. What's left of his life now, who he is, is only what's inside his brain, which is only who he was, nothing more. The future does not exist anymore and the present never did. And no one knows who he was. No one can know unless he tells her, Emma. He could go silent the way he stopped eating, an act of will made easy by exhaustion and the drugs that have killed his appetite. But if he goes silent, he will disappear, except for his memories, all living traces of his past, all the witnesses and evidence have been erased by years of betrayal, abandonment, divorce, annulment, flight, and exile, eaten by time the way his body is being eaten by cancer. Time, like cancer, is the devourer of our lives. When you have no future and the present doesn't exist except as consciousness, all you have for a self is your past. And if, like Fife, your past is a lie, a fiction, then you can't be said to exist except as a fictional character. In telling his story to Emma, Fife is not trying to correct the record, he's trying to stay alive. Or more accurately, he's trying to come to life like a Pinocchio, a puppet made of wood ingeniously carved and assembled so as to closely resemble a real human being, a much admired Canadian documentary filmmaker, a teacher, a beloved friend and husband, a trusted man of the left dedicated to exposing hypocrisy, greed and political corruption. But he's really only a wooden puppet whose strings have frayed and broken one by one. And now his clever maker, Leonard Fife, the man himself, the village woodcarver, can no longer make him dance and play at being a real boy anymore. He lies collapsed in the corner of the woodcarver's hut, a pile of sticks and cloth, until the big, strong Haitian nurse returns to the bathroom and lifts him away from the toilet and wipes his buttocks clean of dribbled shit and reattaches his penis to the tube and swings his body back into the wheelchair. Who is he then? Rene asks him if he wishes to rest in bed or lie on the chaise by the bedroom window. Fife tells her to take him back to the living room. She says that if he returns to the living room, she will have to attach him to the IV. If you insist on continuing with the interview, you will need nourishment and hydration. You are being very foolish, Monsieur Fife. Those people are only interested in making their movie. Madame Fife does not want you to waste your strength on this project. Let her tell them to go away. And if you are strong enough to continue tomorrow, they can come back then. Fife smiles at her. He says, it's like I'm the old Italian carpenter, Geppetto, the guy who made a puppet out of wood named Pinocchio. But I'm too old and feeble now to pull the strings for the puppet show. For the first time, the puppet has to put on the show all by himself. I'm Geppetto, but I'm the puppet too. The wooden puppet who thanks to the intervention by a blue haired fairy was resurrected as a real boy. How does my nose look, Rene? Check it out. Is it longer today than yesterday? Your nose looks the same as always. Did you ever read the story of Pinocchio, Rene? No, but I have heard of it. It is a child's story, is it not? Yes, but it's too scary for children. It's about lying and dying, lying and dying and the vanity of believing in resurrection. You said the real boy was resurrected. No, the wooden boy was resurrected, which gave him a second chance at dying, only this time for real. Wooden boys don't die. 
They're like storybook characters that live on even after the story's over. I would not like it then. I am a Christian. There was a movie about it, was there not? Yes, a Disney movie, but it left out all the scary parts. And the vanity of believing in resurrection, did the movie leave that out? Yes, it did. Then perhaps I would like the Disney movie. I believe in the resurrection. I thought I'd start out on a cheerful note and, <laughs> and read the fun parts. <laughs> um, this book of yours is a terrific novel and uh, it really gets inside of a guy um, like no, I haven't read one completely like this. But a lot of people have talked to me about this novel and the, quite a few similarities between you and the protagonist. Uh, Leonard Fife, and uh, we know all about him from your, what you just read. And uh, I can't see anything because I left my glasses on. <clears throat> um, but I read a story about what happens to you when you turn 80. The guy wrote it when he was 81. And uh, one of the things was that he lost his glasses and he found them in the freezer of the next door neighbor. <laughs> At the readers, that's exactly what I'm, I need. <laughs> yeah, I, I would have loaned you mine, but I'll, I'm helpless without them too. So, <laughs> very good. Thank you. No bifocals. Um. Well, anyway, the. <clears throat> He uh, insists his wife. I'll read this, but I don't know you, you, how much you said of this. He insists his wife, Emma, his third wife, be in the room when he talks for the interview, <clears throat> for the film. He won't tell the truth if he, otherwise, he won't tell the truth. So he confesses that he sees as what his betrayals of her were, and he tells her about them. He's a man who thinks he hasn't loved anyone ever, and nobody has ever loved him. And he wants redemption and love from her before he dies. Well, you, Russell, you are obviously not dying. You're robustly healthy and energetic, doing more things than writers are supposed to do. And uh, you get a few of the pesky ailments that accrue to those of us who manage to get past 80. You're 81, right? Right. And uh, I'm not going to say what I am, but it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's older than that. But in addition to being one of the greatest American novelists, you've been a filmmaker yourself, like Fife, for more than 30 years, and you're still at it. And Fife goes to Cuba to join Fidel Castro's revolution. And you went to Cuba to join Fidel Castro's revolution. Also Jack Kerouac, who went on the road, as we all know, and Huck Finn, who is, is maybe your favorite book of all time, he lit out for the territory. And Jack Kerouac, who I seem to recall, actually came to your house? Yeah, I thought so. One of the worst weeks of my life, actually. <laughs> Kerouac crashed at my house in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. 
<laughs> what about that? Be careful what you wish for. You know? <laughs> what about that scene in the book with uh, Bobby Zimmerman and Joan Baez? Is that real for you? Will you, did you have an evening like that with those two guys? Well, you know, uh, this, is a, this is an interesting and important question probably to try to answer. I'm not sure I can answer it, which is the relationship between the author's personal history. I and, haven't finished the question. Oh, I, <laughs> you I asked me about, about, about Baez and Dylan. Yeah. And because they appear in, in, right. in the life of the uh, main character in the novel. And it, but the implied question, uh, I think, was uh, did they imp appear in the in the life of the novelist, right? Yeah. Well, I don't think I need to answer that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take okay. the fifth well, on okay. that. Well, no. okay, that's fine. fine. It's your privilege. So go ahead on to the question. <laughs> the guy who likes to keep his life secret. He doesn't put it in the novel. Um, all right, so. Um, I don't. I really love those. On the when you went on the road in the book, like Kerouac did, with Nick Farina, right? Nick yeah. Farina, and he steals his father's car, and you steal money from the store you're working for, and uh, I don't know how much you stole. What did you steal? What? That's not you. It's that's it. It's, right. It's right. Leonard Fife. <laughs> no, you would never steal anything. I know that. Yeah. Anyway, I love that scene. I love the, all those scenes. That, that when they get on the road, it's really true. And uh, they drive off from New England to California, and then they're going to head to Australia. <laughs> they're 16 years old. And they, needless to say, they don't get to Australia, but they do get to California eventually. It's a great section, very defining of the kids. But there are more equations, several more between you and Fife. And of course, of course, of course, this is a novel, not an autobiography. And you've also gone out of your way to make Fife an extremely unreliable narrator. Even his wife says he's fantasizing history. And so every, this casts doubt on the veracity of everything he says to the director's camera. So a question is raised. Are you obliquely confessing things that actually happened to you? Is this nobody's business? Are you as unreliable a narrator as your protagonist? And why is the whole story layered with ambiguity? Let's say that that last question is the the last phrase is the is end of question. Too long a question, but I have I, that's the way it is. Mm -hmm. I didn't have enough time to make it sure. No, no, no. It's, it's an important question, and I hope the novel raises not so much the question of what is the truth uh, that lies behind the narrative, the fictional narrative, uh, the truth of the author's life, um, so much as I what I was hoping, among other things, uh, that uh, could be um, dramatized in the novel is um, um, the function of the imagination in the creation of the story of one's life. And I was trying to do this by deliberately alluding to, yes, the facts of my own life, and at the same time making it clear that this is an imagined life. Um, and so that it would, the tension between the two would be persistent and consistent enough throughout the whole of the novel that what might in some other novel be a sub theme would be raised up to a major theme, which is the function of, imag of our imagination in the making of our own life's story through memory and, and through our felt and remembered uh, and, and known experience, our longings, our desires, our read and fantasized and dreamed experience. Um, that the novel could dramatize that. Most novels don't bother with that, but most novels are actually created out of that tension, that very tension. So it, it, there is a meta level to the whole narrative, no question about it, and I, and I wanted that, the reader to be aware of that, but I didn't want to make that the point of the novel. It, it was an attempt to try to use that material and use the insights that I had 
uh, with regard to my own narrative. At, at, I, this is not a book I would have wanted to write and when I was younger, it wouldn't have occurred to me to write when I was younger. Uh, but hitting my late seventies, I became increasingly aware of the of memory and of its fallacies and of its necessity, um, um, of its uh, irrepressible presence in my life. Um, this is I, from the passage that I was reading a little earlier. It's the function of the past in, in, in my present life became greater and greater. And how much of that was reliable? How much of that was true? in some historical sense. Um, and uh, these are all themes that, that became increasingly important to me in my late 70s. And, and, I, and I just tried to write a novel which could touch that, uh, touch that, that rail, that electrified rail in a way that was running through my life it, during those years. It still is, but it was, it was particularly um, present to me and, and particularly uh, um, perplexing, poignant to me uh, over those years that I was working on, on this book. So, so yes, it's deliberate. I'm not trying to play games with the reader uh, or the biographers um, or the critics. Uh, I'm really trying to explore the um, the uh, power and the fallibility of memory um, and um, and the necessity. Among other things, I hope the novel does other things as well. I mean, you mentioned a couple of the, uh, the, the recurring theme of the, um, the runaway, the first the boy, and then the adolescent, and then the, the young man, and then the older man, and now even uh, in old age, a man who has constantly run away from, from the domestic locale of his life. Um, to the territory um, out there, um, which in doing so always inevitably brings with it abandonment and betrayal. Um, you can't run away without leaving something behind or someone, more often the case. So the, the, that theme recurs over and over and over again. And here he is finally at the end, he can no longer run away um, and, and trying to in some way come to, to grips with that and perhaps um, acquire through this confession, through this presentation of, of self to the camera um, can, can in some way provide for himself or obtain for himself redemption for those betrayals and abandonments that have characterized his life, both publicly and privately. I don't know, that's an elaborate answer to your question. Mike, uh, Bill, Mike. Um, if fi the five secrets have kept him from seeing Emma clearly and, um, and from being the object of his best attention, these are your words, and then perhaps in his final blatant willful exposure of his secrets and laws is his way, his only available way to finally give her the quality of attention that makes love possible. Yeah. And despite his unloving and unlovable past, he means to go out loving and loved with no secrets, no laws. It's not heroic. It's merely the end of a lifetime of cowardice. This sounds like a, a really true statement, but is it just his imagination or is he imagining this in order to be, convince himself that that's what he's doing? It's, well, yeah, and, and see if it works with her. I think he is, he is trying to tell her finally the truth. He says that he can't do it unless he's in front of a camera. He can only tell the truth to her right. um, in a sense um, through, <clears throat> through the camera lens. Uh, because if he's with her alone personally, um, he will lie to her and try to seduce her in some way, uh, try to make her love her. And um, it's only through the camera's eye that he can love her sufficiently to tell her the truth of his life as he understands it and as he remembers it. It's a very important, you know, something that runs through this thing is, is a, an awareness that um, 
Fife, and, and, and as it turns out, uh, one or two of the characters as well, is that who you're speaking to um, alters dramatically what you say. Um, and so if he's speaking to the camera alone without his wife present, then he's speaking to everybody. And, um, but if he's speaking to the camera with her present, then he will alter what he says in order to tell the truth. Uh, I think this is, a, this is true for fiction writing, especially perhaps we deal with it every single day when we sit down, we have to decide with each sentence, who is this sentence being uttered to? Even when it's a third person sentence, it's not in the first person cam uh, character's voice you still have to concern yourself with because you have to know what to leave in and what to leave out, what range, what tone to take, what's the, the inflection that you use, what's the vocabulary that you use, the diction, everything, every choice you make with regard to the language that you use is shaped by who you think you're talking to. And, um, and this is true for him. He has to set up a, a, a situation whereby he knows exactly who he's talking to and he's confined by the, by, by the, the limitations the, and, the, and the, the discipline and the rigor of something he understands very deeply, which is the camera. He's a filmmaker above all else, a documentary filmmaker. And, and in that context, he can finally, he finally feels he can tell the truth. I know it sounds probably more complex in, in, in summation than it actually, I hope, that, than it is on the page. I think it's, it's over time, it's, it's much clearer as it unfolds. It's hard to summarize one's own book or its intentions. You, you hope you leave that to the critics and you're never seriously answer, asked to do it yourself. Uh, but as I know you've been through this, uh, but that comes as close as I can get to it uh, in this regard. So, Mike, Bill. My personal, Bill, Mike. My, my personal uh, uh, problem is, uh, is that every time it, it, it has, to, has to be not true when I'm, I'm writing it. Mm -hmm. Because I, I tried to use uh, my own personal experience when I was writing Very Old Bones. <clears throat> and I was trying to recapitulate my life in Germany during the Korean War. And I, I couldn't do it. I mean, I, I was so damn bored by my own life. Yeah. I mean, it was, uh, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't, it had no imagination uh, to it. I had to really reinvent myself in Germany. Um, anyway, and you well, up to now, I mean, I've never almost in anything else ever borrowed so heavily from the events, the actualities of my own life in fiction. And um, it, it is true that I, 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 I moved up as close as I've ever dared, let's say, or been able, uh, I'd rather put it that way, been able to um, approach the actualities of my own life. Um, Almost always, I felt as you did, um, bored by my own life, and and I didn't want to write about it. It just wasn't afraid of it. It just like it left me cold, and left, and I was much more interested in other lives very different from mine, and and uh, or only tangentially connected to mine. But I wasn't interested in my own in my own personal history at all. But I think at this point in my life, uh, hitting my as I said, my late seventies and so forth, I was kind of intrigued by the narrative as it unspooled backwards in time of my own life. And it seemed distant enough almost from me so that I could approach it imaginatively. I mean, that's why it was boring, you know, when, in the past, maybe why it was boring to you when you were trying to write, you know, about your time in, in Germany is it, it, you, you couldn't approach it imaginatively. Whereas in this case, I could now at this point in my life, um, it's, it's, it's different uh, writing for me today. And I don't know if this is true for you, Bill. I'd love to know. We've talked about so much over the years and, and maybe this is something we should talk about too. Um, it, it, in, in this point in my life, I've been writing in, in my case for about 60, over 60 years I've been doing this. You've been doing it for over 70. And, um, and, I, and I find that in these years now I can, I am, more and more inarticulate when it comes to describing the process. 
less and less conscious of what actually goes on when I'm writing um, than I was just 10 years ago, and certainly than I was 20 or 30 years ago. Um, there is, but, and the reason being perhaps that it, it's, I, it, there is a lot less static, there's a lot less anxiety, there's a lot less fear in, in my writing now. And, and I don't worry about anything uh, in between me and the writing. So I feel freer to, to engage material that is in fact, um, yeah, autobiographical, sure, um, that I didn't feel in the past. Uh, there's a kind of liberation that, that, has, that has occurred over the last uh, decade or so, it feels for me. Well, when I was uh, um, uh, writing, when I finished writing Legs after six years, <clears throat> I felt like I was, um, I really learned how to write a novel. I wrote, uh, when my novel was six years old and the manuscripts were that tall and my son was six years old and the manuscripts were taller than he was. <laughs> <clears throat> and, but, and, and I, so I didn't worry for the next few books, I, but every time it was a relearning process, but now in, in these last two, three books, I find it, <clears throat> I'm. I'm re I have to relearn all over again. Uh, it's like I, there's certain things about about the writing process that uh, I have to energize myself to you know, read read the critics again, or, or just there's a there's a something that has to set me off in a, in a way that I guess it's memory that that has has. Uh, you know, di disappeared in certain ways as you age. But anyway, uh, there's another, just one final twist here on 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 the um, the ambiguity of, of this. And what what you, what um, this is uh, uh, Fife's monologue. Uh, he no more knows what he sounds like through Sloan's microphone then he knows what he looks like to Vincent's camera and to the six other people in the room. Here it is. He is sure that he has said nothing that is not true. He has not lied, but he does not know what he said. <laughs> Maybe that's how it goes when you have not lied. You don't know what you said. Only liars know what they have said. All right, anyway, so. I believe uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so. <laughs> Can we go to audience questions maybe now? We promised and oh, the hours okay. coming on. I, um, I, 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 uh, was, all right. We can, I mean, raise your hand if you have a question. Um, I do want to hear, we left that on the table. Why was the Kerouac visit the rest, worst week of your life? Well, I'm bringing Can't this to you. someone. <laughs> Why was the Kerouac visit the worst week of your life? Well, actually, probably wasn't the worst by any means. I've, I've had worse weeks, but uh, it wasn't a great week. Um, he, he showed up at my doorstep um, in Chapel Hill. Uh, I was a, a student uh, living off campus in a rented house with my wife and, and uh, two children. And um, and I got a call from a bar in downtown and said, hey, hey, Russ, uh, Jack Kerouac's in town with, with three guys who say they're Indians and they want to have a party. Can we come out to your house? And uh, and they did. And 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 I looked out the window. Uh, Twenty minutes later, there was a line of cars coming from town out, and they stayed for a week. And and about um, the third night into it, my wife had almost left me by then. And um, and um, and the Indians um, who were Micmac cousins of Garawak from Quebec. Uh, got into the medicine cabinet. This was 1967, and in those days, in most uh, medicine cabinets, uh, younger women like my wife kept a big bottle of dexedrine for diet control, and which you, your doctors would happily prescribe for you. And, uh, and so the Indians got into the medicine cabinet, which is a title I've always wanted to use. Uh, but uh, no dare. <laughs> But as a result, Kerouac and, and everybody else stayed up for another four days. Um, 
until finally, finally he left and moved on down to Orlando, where shortly after that, in fact, he died. Anyhow, yeah, that's the Kerouac story. <laughs> they get the bones of it, anyhow. <laughs> yes. So I have a, a question because the words came up early. Uh, one was confession inside the plot, and the other is redemption. I'm sorry, I didn't. Redemption you... came up. You mentioned redemption. So I want to know, <clears throat> and I'm not asking from Bill's point of view about you, but the character feels that if he delves his wife in the movie through the process of other witnesses, he is telling her something and then she will speak some sort of forgiveness? That, yeah, that, that, that cuts to it. Uh, the question is, is really for her and indirectly then, therefore, for us, the reader, and maybe more even directly than that, though, for me, the writer, can I forgive him? Do I forgive him? Um, at the, in the, by the end. Um, and so you know, that, it's a question I can't answer for anybody else, but I can for myself. And yes, uh, by, by the end of the novel, I, I forgive him. Um, he dies alone, um, and he is aware of that, um, and, uh, and the pain of that, uh, but the clarity of that um, makes it possible for me to forgive him because he's conscious of that. He, he comes to consciousness uh, through that. Is there a redemption Yes, yes, you will see that in the book, I think. And then the next to last chapter, I think is where, you know, it's, it's, it's made up of, of, of 22 chapters and, and you get there. Um, you know from chapter one, he's going to die before this book is over. And, yeah, and so are we all, exactly. But, but, but to get to that point, the question is exactly the one you raise. Is, is redemption possible? And yes, it's possible only if we forgive him. We have the authority as writers, godlike authority as writers and readers. And, and the question is whether we forgive him or not. So I leave that to you to answer. I believe so. so there is that of right. From online to right. Realization and sorrow with the hope of love. It's it's implicit and, and, and buried under perhaps the title for gone. Um, and I will confess that the book is modeled. Um, as I think in every novel with literary ambition it has in it a kind of a ghost in the works, a, a, a novel that that whether the writer is conscious of it or not, um, hovers over it um, and guides it in some ways. And, and in this case, it, it's the death of Ivan Ilyich, uh, Tolstoy's great long story. I was very conscious of writing that in that shadow and uh, with that intentionality, um, both structurally and um, in terms of the character, Ivan Ilyich and, and, um, and Leo uh, Fife. So, um, yes, I hope so. Um, hi, what a pleasure it is to see both of you, uh, living legends, but you're living. <laughs> and you're writing and you're working and you're doing what you've been doing all along. It's such an inspiration. And uh, thank you, uh, thank you for being the people you are and for giving us the magical works you provide for us. I did have a thought though about what you were saying about redemption. And I don't want you, I'm going to buy the book, but I thought as long as you're sitting here. Um, so he's, he's someone who went to Canada from um, that age where that was certainly an option. Um, but he stayed there. 
And at one point, our country allowed those who had gone over, I think Clinton was the one who signed it, that there was a clemency, a general clemency. So, on, and there again is the idea of forgiveness. The country was willing to take them back. So I'm just wondering if that becomes an, uh, something in the book that Fife is, that you, that Fife is special. Yeah, no, it's, it, that's, that's, that's built into it. Um, the, the whole um, um, business of, of fleeing uh, to Canada to um, avoid uh, military service uh, in Vietnam and regarding that as a principled stand. Actually, Joan Baez does come into the story at that point because there were 60,000 Americans who went north. Trudeau, senior father of the current uh, prime minister, um, offered them refugee status, which meant they couldn't be extradited to the United States to the great frustration of Lyndon Johnson and then, and then Richard Nixon. And all the FBI agents who were chasing these guys down were sent out of the country, out of Canada, back to the US. And, and so uh, these men, and they were all men, and they were mostly white, they were college educated um, in their 20s, regarded themselves as something like heroes. And the Canadians did too, uh, by and large. Joan Baez appeared on the scene to give a great concert in Toronto, which is described in the book, and she denounced them. Denounced them for not staying home in the United States and going to prison as her husband, David Harris, had done. And stopping, as she said, the war machine. Um, if 60,000 American men had refused to, be, to, to, had refused to go into the military and had chosen prison instead, the war would have ground to a halt almost immediately. That was her argument. And it was a radical confrontation, self-confrontation among those Canadians there. So there's running through this, the story of the American expats uh, who, who went north. And he's a, he's a man who was among that, that, that cohort who went north. And that's his personal public history um, and what he's identified as throughout. He's, and he, part of what he's describing is the um, actual conditions of his going north, which were much more morally ambiguous than, than perceived from outside. Remind you that there are uh, books for sale. Bill's got, go ahead. I'm, I'm not cutting you off, Bill. I'm just reminding you. Get it one more, absolutely. We got time. No, we, we're not going to keep that. Well, this is, this, 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 this could have been a half hour or 40 minute conversation. But I want to make it, you know, very brief. In, in 2000, the year you got to put the mic up, Bill. The year 2000, Russell wrote a terrific essay in Harper's Magazine, and it was called Who'll Tell the People? And it, uh, he decided uh, uh, that nobody in America was writing the story of American origin, America's origins. Uh, uh, and he singled out me and a few other writers, Toni Morrison, as having not fulfilled the, the not, we, we haven't done it. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that it's true. It's a, it's a very logical story that he wants to go back and, and define the, the origins of this nation in fiction, starting in the be the early, the very early 17th century. And, um, and what he says we're all doing, he says is, uh, oh, uh, what we have been doing in, in the 20th and 21st century is, is not one story of our beginnings, but many that we tell ourselves. Euro-American, origin tales, African-American, Native American, Asian-American, Latin American, and so on. Also, he mentioned a few new constituencies that have come into existence in recent years. 
women, poets, people with incurable illnesses, uh, and so on. And all these groups compete with one another. And here's a direct quote. I don't mean to criticize contemporary tellers of these tales, many of whom William Kennedy, Toni Morrison, Louise Erdrich, Maxine Ong, Kingston, Rudolfo, Anaya, are powerful deep writers. The point here is that none of their stories alone is sufficient unto itself as an American story of origins. Now, he has, in, in later in the essay, much later, it's a long essay, it's a wonderful essay. I read it four or five times. I just read it again in, yesterday. And, and, and he said, you, he offers a theory that uh, the one narrative that all Americans, North and South, could share and do share is the African diaspora. There is no town, no country, no state in America that has not been profoundly affected by the events, characters, themes, and values dramatized by the story of race in America. And so that's, that's this, that's in a nutshell, uh, that's the premise of, of this long, wonderful essay. And it's a, it's a challenge, of course, and uh, uh, I think that uh, I, I, I think that uh, I wonder about what what you've been doing, uh, what you think about your own work. I mean, I, I when I think about all the books that you've written, I think that you you know if you start collecting certain of them like Cloud Splitter and uh, Continental Drift and Rule of the Bone and. Uh, uh, the darling and the what and uh, and and, and uh, uh, these books are seem like a beginning if you collect them uh, a beginning of of your novel uh, your your, your uh, realized work of fiction uh, it would be i guess so it's it's not a a, a conscious and deliberate and lifelong decision um it, it's simply the, the the products of my own consciousness and imagination and my, my own way of understanding um, the world that surrounds me. Um, um, and, and it happens that as a result of, of, of um, my uh, body of work now having accumulated, one can say that, can see that, that there is, there is obviously unifying themes and consistent and recurring themes and they almost always loop back around to um, to um, the origin story of, 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 of race um, in, in America and on this continent um, and um, how it how it, it, it lives on um, into the present and, and, and into the foreseeable future. Um, and it's a story that uh, I feel compulsively drawn back to every time I sit down to work. I, I don't feel that I, I've made a decision. It's ideological or even sociological or historical. It's not that kind of a decision. It's just drawn back to how I see the world and how I see human beings in, in the context that seems to me to surround human beings, surrounds me surrounds my children, surrounds my grandchildren, surrounds my neighbor's lives, surrounds the lives of everyone in this room. Um, it's how I see it. Um, and the work will necessarily then therefore express that and I hope in dramatic and, and interesting and engaging, emotionally moving ways that ring true to the reader and correspond to the reality that the reader sees as well. So, but that that essay you're 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 citing is is was a kind of attempt to make a statement out of out of that, uh, where you sometimes do step aside and, and stop and listen to your own song, and and say, um, oh, I, I see, that's what uh, that's what that song is trying to do, trying to say, and and you hear your own voice for a minute or two, and um, in a way that you normally don't. Yeah. See what you, this is the nature of your own enterprise, your own lifelong work, and, and so that was one of those moments where I was trying to do that, to take that 
didn't take that you, long. You long. wrote this 20 years ago. So what is your conclusion, what your conclusion as of the moment? What was the status of, what's the possibility of this book ever getting written, this great American uh, Creole novel? Well, I mean, I don't think it has been written. I don't think I certainly don't think I've written it, <laughs> but uh, but maybe one could write it uh, if one had ten or twenty chances and 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 approached it 20, ten or twenty different ways and directions. I don't know. Uh, Do you think uh, anybody's writing it in that right now? That the last person who I thought wrote it or uh, came as close as it, as anyone has in our in our literary history of our time um, is, uh, is Toni Morrison. Um, I don't think anyone else has come as close as she to writing the novel of um, the, our, our creolized um, birthright. And, um, and I think she did that more than anyone else has. It's a wonderful night. Let's hear it for Russell Banks and William Kennedy.